So, it's Marianne Hobbs. Welcome along if you are just joining us. Today we've put together a very special Spirit of Sylvian program devoted to David Sylvian. Some of David's music is reissued this season, so Solar Records, Blemish and Manaphon, and Japan, Exercising Ghosts, the Half Speed Remaster. So I thought I'd reach out and ask David if he might be interested in speaking with us after 14 years of silence. And, well, right now, you're going to hear a very special audio diary recorded by David at his home in America. And I'm going to say that I, I don't think what kind, it matters what kind of relationship you have with David Sylvian. You might be a committed fan. You may be brand new to him, but I think you'll find David's thoughts and ideas about how he shapes his creative process really inspiring. This piece is different for us. It's a, a long-form piece of narrative storytelling self-authored by David Sylvian. And, well, my instruction to you, wherever you are, is just allow this piece to unfold and listen. Hello, Marianne. This is David. Thank you for inviting me to appear on your radio show. I had to give it some thought as to whether it was the right thing to do. Because I haven't spoken to the media for... 14 years or so, radio, television, certainly a lot longer, maybe. The last time was around 2005, so nothing personal, but I had to make sure it was the right thing for me to do at this juncture, and if you're hearing this, then you know that I've decided that it is. So I thought I'd start by talking about the origins of my record label, Samadhi Sound which ran from 2003 for, I'm going to say about 10 years. I was living in Sonoma, California, and I was working on a series of retrospectives and remixes for the Virgin label. This was just prior to his parting ways. So there was a lot of looking back over the catalog to some degree. I mean, I was working on material that had been left incomplete, and this was my last opportunity to to really have access to that material and complete it. And during this period in, in time, I made a move with my family to New Hampshire where we lived in what well, used to be an ashram so it was a rather large building I'd say a three family home occupied by four people so it was it was quite a spacious arrangement uh, there was a carriage house on the property which I stripped down to an A-frame and, and had built into a what was for me an ideal studio, an ideal working space. And somebody like me only gets to do this once in a lifetime. It was a really beautiful place in which to work. Standing firm on this stony ground. So as soon as I was done with this material that I promised Virgin Records before parting ways, I managed to complete the studio, and as I hadn't recorded new material in a considerable amount of time, I decided to uh, just enter the studio with, with nothing in mind, no compositions. I just thought I'd focus on my relationship with the guitar and see how things evolved from there. So I improvised, I mean, let's, let's say, four, four or five minutes on guitar, then added a series of first takes to that first take. So it was a series of improvisations with no editing involved. And slowly the piece began to take shape. It was unconventional by um, some writing standards, but it felt right to me at that moment in time. And uh, at the end of the day, I sat down and wrote a set of lyrics, basically recorded the the lead vocal there and then. Ask me I'm late night shopping. The structure was very different. You know, working with an open-ended structure was 
exciting, interesting. The uh, recording session was interrupted by a long-term tour, and um, so it was quite a while before I got back to the studio. And when I did, I gave myself six weeks to complete an album along the same lines. So my first day in the studio, I, I believe I recorded the title track for Blemish, which is something like a 15-minute piece of music. Um, same approach, uh, improvised on guitar, and then continued to add a series of first takes, um, synthesizers, CD players, run through guitar pedals, this kind of thing. And then sat down and wrote a set of lyrics in the manner of Ginsbergian way of automatic writing, um, which stems from Buddhism, I guess. And I really enjoyed that process and recorded that lead vocal as soon as the lyrics were completed. I fall. And within, I'd say, 48 hours, something like that, the track was completed. There was the dichotomy because I really felt like there was something new happening here. The structure was open-ended. It was unlike anything I'd personally heard before. So there was a little bit of a sense of elation there. I had done away with traditional structure and that was a relief because, you know, having worked on this retrospective work for Virgin, I'd become tired of what I saw as um, the, the uh, structures that I would fall back on quite readily and, and quite naturally. I loved a lot of those songs, but it was it was time to move on. I needed a breath of fresh air. I needed new motivation. One push, you're Okay. Ah, uh, would you look at that? Los Angeles. So I recorded a series of pieces by myself and um, decided that I needed a counterpoint to my own voice. And the first person that came to mind in that respect was the guitarist Derek Bailey. Now, I'd been familiar with Derek's work since the mid-80s. In fact, I'd considered working with him on the album Gone to Earth. I wasn't sure if our two very divergent styles could be forged together in some way. And back in 1995, no, they certainly couldn't have been. But in 2003... It seemed like a real possibility. So I got in touch with Derek. You know, Derek's very forthright. He's uh, very blunt, very humorous. And he, he asked if I was basically asking the right person to provide this material for me. And I said I, I was. I knew that I was. And because I wanted a challenge. respond to. He said, well, I can certainly provide you with that. So he recorded about an hour's worth of material in London, all improvised, of course, that is the nature of his work. Send that to me, and I, I got a three tracks out of that set that worked well. And this left me with one final track, which I'd written, I had a bass line, um, a rough guitar part, and I'd recorded the lead vocal. And I decided I wanted, um, I wanted an electronic arrangement for the piece, something a little more radical. And fortuitously, just at that time, Christian Finez got in touch with me. He sent me a copy of his album, Endless Summer, and asked if I'd be interested in collaborating. So 
So I sent him this track and to see how he'd respond, to see if it, it worked for him. And about a week or two later, he, he returned the track to me with this absolutely beautiful, gorgeous electronic orchestration. It was really beautiful. And that kind of wrapped up the album for me. There is always sunshine. So this was a new beginning, in a sense. Blemish took off in a way that I don't think anybody had really foreseen happening. Although management liked the album, they didn't think they could shop it, they didn't think anybody would be interested in it. So we set up an online mail order situation, and very quickly there was a demand from distributors to take the album on. So... In virtually no time, we had a label proper, which was very pleasing to me because I think subconsciously um, leaving Virgin had given me the permission to really explore any territory I, I wish to. And I can continue on that way now that I had my own label. And simultaneously, I could provide a platform for other artists that I admired. So, um, you know, that's the way things began to pan out. I undertook a tour for Blemish because of the positive response to it. On that tour, I met up with uh, Bernd Friedman, who attended a show in Germany, and he suggested that I come to Cologne at the end of my tour. I had just about enough time to get there, as there was a three-day festival of improvised music, of which he was a part. I did go to Cologne. I remember I met Byrne again that night. Uh, he gave me a CDR of uh, demos of some kind, allowing me to choose which, which tracks appealed to me. And I remember that first night I wrote the first of our collaborative works, which was a track called A History of Holds. I'm having my day And then I, I was invited to Tokyo to promote the Nine Horses album. I was invited to a, an island by the name of Naoshima, where a particular individual had uh, invested in the island, um, producing a couple of museums and these so-called art houses, which were houses that he bought in a, in a small fishing village and he had invited international renowned artists to come and work in the houses and make them their own. So people would wander the streets of this small village and uh, visit these rather wonderful art houses. And within, let's say, 30 minutes of my arrival on the island, I was invited to create an instrumental work that would accompany these walks through the village. It was a productive time, possibly the most productive of my life, and I, I really did enjoy the process of running the label, creating a platform for other artists whose work couldn't find a home elsewhere, um, and working very closely with the designer Chris Big to create a visual element to the entire uh, catalog. That was also another aspect of the work that gave me great pleasure creating a visual identity for the label and so on. Prova Provivas nyheter utan tillsatt socker, utan sökningsmedel. Magiskt. Philips Air Fryer XXL med smart sensing teknik. Philips. And um, that more or less brought the label to a close. There was one more recording that I did again, mainly alone, but with the input with the very essential input of the poet Franz Wright, who at that point was suffering from cancer. Uh, he came to a studio close by to where he was living in Boston and um, really committed to providing me with the spoken word, reading his own work. 
I stayed in touch with, with, with Franz for the remainder of his life, uh, and he was a great inspiration to me. Uh, a really beautiful man and the most amazing poet. Um, so that was the final work that I produced for Samadhi Sound, which went by the name of There's a Light That Enters Houses with No Other House in Sight, which is a, a line from one of Francis' um, poems. And so that brings us up to date in terms of uh, you know, what happened to the label and its conclusion. Marianne Hobbs, this is BBC Radio 6 Music and you are listening to a very special audio diary recorded for us by David Sylvian, the first time he's broken his media silence in 14 years. The piece was self-authored by David and recorded for us at his home in America. If I break down or mix it up, most in real they're selling out, for the money I'm a brother man I buy you free like yo, R.P.A.P. Brody Cody, I'm a hostel, please let yo. You ask me how I feel about younger generations of artists working with samples of my material. I get to hear the material early on because I have to give it my permission for the use of the samples. If I hear something that I think is of interest, it, there's an original voice in there somewhere. Paul Salou, for example, you can hear the sample used in a creative fashion, and so there is you know, an immediacy to allow them to use the, my work within the context of theirs. There's not necessarily respect involved when somebody takes a sample of your work and incorporates it into their own. It's more a matter of convenience, that, that they stumbled across something that they like, it sits well with their material. Everything seems to gel for them. And then they get in touch and ask for permission. It tends to be, as far as I can tell, more a matter of um, good fortune, you know, that these elements come together and work. And um, I'm perfectly okay with that. You ask how I feel about the re-releases of, of um, my band's material, uh, such as Exercising Ghosts, which is uh, about to be released. I can honestly say that I've not heard a note of that material since the band broke up. I guess I outgrew it by the time the band separated. I tend not to have the inclination to look back, whether it's on the band's work or my own, it feels detrimental in some way to do so, to have a forward momentum, rather than keep looking over your shoulder at what you have done, at your successes and your failures. Could I ever explain? recall one successes. I mean, I can tell you which albums have, I've produced that work in their entirety. And I can point out albums that have weak spots where I didn't do a particular song justice and I felt it a failure on my part. And that knowledge never leaves you. You don't have to go back and revisit it and double check. Um, has that changed with time? There is an internal knowledge that is irrefutable. You know very well when you've produced an entire album that is fully uh, realized. And you know when that's, that's not the case. It was reaching through the clouds. Uh, Scott Walker was asked a similar question about his past work. Did he listen to it? Of course he didn't. Was he ashamed of it? He wasn't. He had just moved on into an entirely different creative period of his life. And I feel I've done the same. I, did, I mean, a completely different path, obviously. But if I look back 
over the work that I produce. I don't feel I, any shame attached to the work. It's, the, um, it's not that I'm avoiding it in any sense, in that there's any regret there. I tend to think the band was one of the best of that period in time. I mean, I'm fairly certain of that. I know we didn't receive the same amount of attention, certainly the similar amount of acclaim that other bands uh, achieved. But I feel like we had a lot to offer, particularly in the last years of our existence. Uh, I have no doubt about that. And like I said, I feel no need to go and uh, revisit it to confirm that for myself. I've worked on uh, audiovisual installations over the years. There's a through line in a way, you know, because I'm involved in the visual element, often responsible for the uh, original concept of the visual element, as well as the audio. So it's born of the same aesthetic, if you will. Uh, I've created the artwork for album covers going back as far as, say, um, or at least as far as quiet life. I've enjoyed that process. One tries to find the right image that works well with the music or works in contrast with what one finds when one listens to the, the audio. I've also produced uh, photographic works. Um, I recently published a book which was based on my road journeys through America. And I was using an iPhone while driving um, to capture these images. And the iPhone could not keep up with the, the, with the speed of the, the vehicle. Uh, it would create these errors. And the errors were what interested me as much as the uh, photographic element itself. The car was moving so fast that if you caught sight of something you wanted to take a photograph of, um, you were never really sure if you captured it. Tex-Mex is for sharing. Tex-Mex is for sharing. Santa Maria. Proppsmagasinet har allt du behöver till dina hemmaprojekt. Uh, you didn't have time to, to look at the photograph. It was difficult enough to grab the image itself. So by night I would take a look at what I'd shot during the day. I would work on the material, originally in color, then I'd flip it to black and white and work on it further. And I felt there was something there. I enjoyed the errors and so in a sense this played back into my love of working with technology and music where the technology malfunctions and something other is created than intended. So this is a form of innovation, if you like. In the context of a band or working solo, you might have four bars, 16 bars you need to fill with material that is appropriate, relevant, and most people might turn to, you know, guitarists and say, well, you go for it, you know. And I was often not in that position. And I'm glad that I wasn't because the process of, of trying to find what might work in that context produced um, material that was innovative in some sense. And in, in a sense, that was what made the recording process exciting, particularly if I'd written the material in its entirety before entering the studio. And it had been rehearsed, say, with the band, so we knew kind of where we were going with it. But there were just these moments where there was the unknown, and you, I wasn't always certain what I was going to place in this, these, uh, these vacant spaces. And that's where the, the pleasure of the recording process came into play. That process of discovery, of experimentation, 
with, even within the confines of a, a three-minute pop song or whatever. In fact, you know, pop music is, is frequently innovative in that respect. And I think that's why I continue to call myself a pop musician, regardless of where I go musically. Because many, if not all of the other genres of music are pretty well defined. Pop music is a broad church, you know, and uh, if you place your work in that context, you are broadening it more so. And I think this is a very positive thing. It allows you not to be pinned down quite so easily. And it allows for pop music to embrace so much more than the three-minute song that you may uh, see as uh, sitting at the top of the iTunes charts or whatever. There's many different iterations of what um, pop music is or could be, what it might be. And so I've always felt very comfortable working within that field, no matter what I produce. And I was brought up on pop music, you know, so again, to speak about aesthetic, that aesthetic is there, it's present. It's, it's uh, part of who I am, it's part of my musical DNA. And I would never want to deny that. So, Marianne, I'm not going to listen back to what I've uh, spoken to you about, because if I do, I know I'll delete it. Um, this is inevitable. But I'm grateful that you asked me to, to be involved in your show. I apologize for what I'm sure is my mid-Atlantic accent. I've lived in America for 29 years. Um, my children are, were born here. It's inevitable, but it would annoy the out of me if I had to listen to it. So that aside, I would just like to once again thank you for having me on your program. David Sylvian on BBC Radio 6 Music, his first dialogue with the media in 14 years.